Uh, I must have fell off. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in politics too long. <laughs> a single, uh, Phil Dodd and Gary Clements, and uh, together we're the, uh, the folks that put together this meeting. We meet uh, twice a year, roughly. Uh, we've been meeting for a few years, so this is our fifth meeting. Um, just so we know our audience by a show of hands, how many folks are here for the first time? Wow, okay, good to know, good to know. Thanks for, thanks for coming. So uh, for those here for the first time, uh, you know, we started this, this group just for informal discussions. A lot of us are of a certain demographic that we're, some of us own larger homes than we want and we're looking to downsize um, and we'd love to stay in or around Montpelier. And uh, yeah, I'm being waved by Fran back there. For those who are here for the first time, please make sure you sign up so we have your name on the mailing list for future emails and meeting notices. And the sign up sheet is right in the back there. Um, yeah, so we kicked this off just to have an informal discussion with other <coughs> like-minded community folks who are thinking about what we do, trying to age in place, trying to stay in the area, and realizing that there weren't a lot of options for us here in, in the community, and hoping that, and, and I think by the sheer volume of people, how many do we have on our mailing list now? 200. 200 people on the mailing list. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of community interest, and we've had the good fortune of having some people who are interested in uh, maybe developing some sites that might be appropriate for folks like us. Um, so we are hearing from some of them today. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll hear from Carrie. But it, are there any questions of anybody who are here for the first time, just quickly to get things off? Are you? Okay. So we want to stay on, on schedule. And um, so for purposes of doing that, I will turn it over to Carrie to talk about the survey we've done. Thank you. Um, thanks to everybody who um, was kind enough to complete the survey. Um, it's fairly anonymous, but we went through SurveyMonkey um, to be able to get the number of responses and the number of questions on there that were really important. Also, because we were able to retain you know, the email addresses, which are totally confidential, but if those of you who completed the survey, um, but you did it through a link, then we don't have your email address. So we want to make sure that if you're interested, you also don't you know, realize you're not part of the mailing list if you didn't complete the survey from um, something we sent you directly rather than the link. <coughs> anyway, so um, without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and um, <coughs> do this. Um, so these are our questions. I'm really not going to be really deep on this because I think everybody can kind of see. I'm sorry, the, the TV's over this way and you have to turn, but you only have to press on. So um, if you add these together, you either the unsure or the purchase, there are a lot of people who would be open to purchasing a new place. The problem in Montpelier is there aren't a lot of new places to purchase. So um, that's part of it. Carrie, maybe you can read some of the percentages. It's hard to see. So I'll try to bring you yeah. to see it. Yeah. Okay, so for those who are, and if anybody wants these, you can always, um, I guess, let Fran know. I can send you the PDF. It's going to be easy enough, or I can yeah. just send it to the group. Um, so people who want to purchase are 35%. People who want to rent were just 7%. People who want to could do either, 37%. And those who were not sure were 20%. So there's quite a few people who own homes who really want to go downsize. So um, how many people completed it? So this was how soon do you want to downsize? So some people wanted to do it, say 13% want to do it right away. Now this survey went out in July and end of the end of September. So that's the time period. So within one year, one to two years was 25%, two to three was 19%, and then three to five was 22%, and then over five was 20%. So it's kind of all over the map, but it's pretty consistent one to five years. And then on the size unit, and this is for square feet. Some people don't really know what their square footage is to where they are now, but I just would like to communicate. Do you really know how small under a thousand square feet really is? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's pretty 
timing. Um, so 1,200, um, I went out to see a um, grouping of over 55 homes on Grand Isle that have just been built. They were each of them 1,500 square feet and they were duplexes, really nicely done. Um, and that was about the right size and, and for two people. Now for one person, obviously you could probably do a little bit less. But um, more than 2,000 square feet isn't really terribly downsizing, <laughs> but that's, um, we had a few people who wanted to do that. Um, and then, I have a seat. That's the same. That's the same. Okay, there we go. Um, so living on a single level, that was really important, but up in New England, <coughs> living on a single level for, is, is really challenging because we don't have a lot of homes that are on a single level. If you had a second floor that was for a guest room or for a studio or something like that, that could be a little bit different, but then getting up and down stairs um, to say nothing of um, <coughs> um, where it would be located, you know, getting around that way. <coughs> so from the standpoint of purchasing, I'm sorry, I didn't get a percentage there. Huh? I'll try to do that. Um, so for our freestanding, Um, <clears throat> so people like the idea of a small freestanding house, which was about, now there was, this was checked off in, you could do multiples, like in choice of top, you know, preferred, most preferred to least preferred. So you're not going to find the percentages equal. But the number one was 57%, their first choice was a freestanding small house. The second choice was a single level condo. Um, and then the third choice of the first one was a tiny house. That's tiny. Um, and then a townhouse and a duplex. So it's kind of all over, but that's the, in order. For a small freestanding, single level condo, townhouse, duplex, tiny house. <clears throat> and then for renting. So there were slightly different preferences. I think a lot of people in Montpelier um, think that um, a condo is an apartment. But a condo is a legal structure, so whether you have single family, or whether you have duplex, whether you have townhouse, whether you have apartment, they're all can be condos. So it's just how it's a legal structure. Um, so that is for rental. 50% um, want a small house. 47% want a single level apartment. 8% want a townhouse. 4% want a duplex, and some to share. And then some don't want to rent at all, they want to buy. What defines a townhouse? Townhouse is two levels, so you have two floors, and you, you can arrange it so that you have your living on all one floor, and then you can go from there. Um, Gary, can I just interrupt for one yeah. minute? I think we can send a link around of all of the survey results with the wrap up of the meeting, right? Um, I'm not sure about a link, but maybe. Okay. Or a PDF. Or we can send a PDF, yeah. that's not a problem. Okay, so for those that I see taking a lot of notes, we'll do our best to somehow compile all this information and get it out to you. Yeah, I didn't want to do a printed handout because it's 30 pages, and I've got to kind of overwhelm it. Um, and how many bedrooms, um, and I'm not going to, these we start to get into more minutia, which I don't think we need. How many parking spaces, either one or two, um, what kind of number of bathrooms, um, these. We gathered this information because we would be talking to builders, we were talking to realtors, we talking to people who have a vested interest in understanding what the community is really looking for. Could you say what those price ranges are? Um, yeah, I'm getting there. Um, yeah, you just, just, just passed pass through it. it. Well, did I pass Back through up. it? Yeah. <laughs> Back up okay. two. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to do that. Um, maybe it's from then. Is that 13? No, that is not You have? Um, yeah, I'm not normally doing this. <coughs> so, there is price range. Let me just see. That's French. One more. So, there was one more. One more about heart? A lot. You don't want that. Below that. One more down. Okay, the maximum price range. Well, the maximum price range for renting is down the maximum price range. There you go. That's it. Oh, no, no, that's for our thing. This is where I'm going to get the books for you. That's right. That's right. Definitely not millennials. Okay, so um, that's the 
cash for prices for renting and maximum for renting? Um, which is, that, is that what people were looking for? I'm sorry, did I go through it too quickly? It's really interesting because you can't rent an apartment in Montpelier with two bedrooms for $1,500 a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe that you had a slide that showed what home prices okay. yeah, so two down, down. Two, two down. It's like 13 or 14. It was before this then? Uh, <laughs> okay, hold on. It's another reality check that I think the town has really got to look at, or the city. Um, I spent too many years on that, so um, So at 100 to 199,000 to purchase is a little unrealistic in this area. Um, what was the I think percentage on that? What's that? What was the percentage? Was the percentage on that is 42 percent want to buy between 100,000 and 199,000. Now there is one place I looked at in Barrytown and they are doing a development there. Their places start at 199, but that's start. And I don't know what that includes. I don't know what the amenities are. They haven't built them yet, but it's specto, uh, they're prefab housing. <clears throat> I mean, they have a nice spot. I have a information here if somebody wants to look at that after the meeting. Um, so that's about as close as you're gonna get prefab community in Barry for 199 and that's a starting price. So I think you need to really look at it. I don't know whether people think that the valuation of their existing homes is, is, is really, really high, and so they need to be able to sell those and live on the, add the proceeds from the sale, so therefore can only buy a, a lower priced house. But I think when you're considering downsizing, you really have to kind of look at a little bit higher price range. <clears throat> What's the second one? The second is uh, 200 to 299, and then it goes down up from there. So that was then 300 to 399, 400 to 499. I mean, we even had somebody who would do 600,000 and up. <laughs> Maybe that was a joke. I don't know. <laughs> okay, living within walking distance to Montpelier. It was very important um, to most people. But what's happening in downtown Montpelier is moving at a glacial speed, and most of us don't have that kind of time to think about it. <laughs> um, and then how far from downtown Montpelier, if you want to live? So people looking at, okay, to, can I be in a community that's a little bit not right in the downtown, but is kind of close? So we are getting near. So that's um, a 21% live within a quarter mile, 20, 34% live within a half a mile, and then a half mile to one mile, with mile would be like 36%. So there's, there's some flexibility there. Um, and then if you found something that wasn't in Montpelier, would you move there? And so there's a lot of people think, oh, okay, well maybe, you know, I can think about it. And I guess it really depends on what do you mean by not in Montpelier? Because it depends on how far away you want to go. That circle drawn. Um, this is another concept. I'll talk about this a little bit later. But if you're interested in housing that includes a kind of a mini community center, which would reduce the amount of square footage you might need in your own house. So people were interested in the other options. So I'll show this. What's most important? <clears throat> so people would like, this would be exercise room, guest room for people coming from out of town that could actually be a rent type of thing, um, a shared um, community kind of kitchen, I think that was part of it, and then workshop and studio space. I think those were the top four. Um, that came through because my, my dad had a place and they had a community center, then they moved to a place that found out they didn't have a community center. And they said that was the biggest thing they missed, was being able to have a place for people to gather and you know, just libraries and other possibilities, something like that, and share books. Um, <clears throat> so different amenities, you know, this isn't all that important right now because I think that's something that's going to be going forward. Um, people want washer dryers and a balcony and a deck and an open floor plan and a temper thing and yeah, yeah. So that's kind of you know, more for those people who are builders who are maybe say, okay, what do people want? Um, and this was interesting. If you're ready to 
would you be able to put a, you know put a deposit on a place or a battle place before you sold the house? So that would really bring kind of lenders into the picture, I would think. <clears throat> Um, oh, that's what you'd like. Thank you. Um, the services, um, which was obviously snow removal, garden and lawn removing, trash removal, that's kind of what we have in our house right now. Um, I went to visit a couple of independent living places, which gave me a really nice printout of, okay, list down all of the expenses you have in your current house. Then realize that if you're a condo, that a management fee or a maintenance fee covers that, or that you would have a group that would be you wouldn't have to deal with that anymore. So it's, it becomes substantial, and I don't think people realize how much you actually really pay out on maintaining a home, <clears throat> oh, especially a large one. Okay. So there are some people who would live. Would you live full time? And that was 58 or 59 percent. And then if you live in a home part of the year, it would be 17 percent. Some people were not sure. Um, so there are some people who travel who would, you know, they might spend some time in a warmer climate uh, during the winter. <clears throat> and this was more for realtors. How long have you lived in your home? Most people um, was 51 uh, percent was over 20 years. So there's a lot of people who have been in their homes a long time, and believe me, the realtors are looking at this, saying, oh, we got to free up some space so we can bring in some young families. <laughs> 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 and they love cash. <laughs> and this is just kind of how many bedrooms do you have in your house now. Um, that's not all that critical, two, three, and four. I was surprised at how many people had four bedrooms. You know, three and four. So it shows that, you know, totally empty nesters. <clears throat> Kids don't like it when they can't come back and visit moms. So. Um, yeah. Employment status, um, retired was 66%. So it's obviously the graying of the town. Um, Semi-retired is like 17, 18%. And semi-retired can be just about anything. I mean, you, you make any kind of income at all from anything you do. Um, and then employ part time, and then the only full time people would be like seven percent. So it's it's obviously a, a different. Um, so okay, Terry, we probably got time for a few more. Okay, he's the he's the timekeeper over there. Okay, independent living, and that's it. We're done. How perfect timing. <laughs> Um, thanks very much. We will make an effort to get a PDF out by email to everybody, uh, so that that's going to be well documented. Also, I should mention ORCA is filming this, and I think they'll be showing this meeting on TV. So uh, we'll try and let you know when that might be, or for people who couldn't make this meeting. Um, I really want to thank Carrie for this survey. She put a lot of work into it. She paid for the survey month the account. Uh, it was really a great effort, and things to be very useful. So, another round of applause. <laughs> One thing, I'm going to talk briefly about real estate prices uh, because, as Carrie pointed out, there may be. Uh, oh, I'm sorry? How many people responded to the survey? 124, I heard. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, it was apparent that you know there may be a little bit of a disconnect there on, on terms of pur purchasing in particular. I, looking at through the survey myself, I saw. 74% uh, wanted a two-bedroom unit, 37% wanted one and three-quarter baths, 64% uh, wanted to be within walking distance, uh, and 42% wanted to buy between 100 and 199. Um, prices are a lot higher than that in Montpelier. Uh, this, and they're probably going to be even high for, for new buildings that might happen. Just building costs are very high these days, and that's, that's just the reality. The good news is if you're one of those people who's been in the house for 20 years, 51 percent, you're probably going to get more for your house perhaps than you realized. Um, I looked at some statistics from the realtors uh, keep track of all the sales statewide and, and in different towns. Uh, statewide, January through September, we had um, sales were up a little bit and the average price jumped 4.3 percent to 224,000. Uh, that brought down, things are selling fairly quickly, so the month supply of properties for sale was 9.8 months. Uh, 
realtors generally say if it's below six months, that's a, a seller's market. If it's above six, it's, it's more of a buyer's market. Uh, condos were, were very similar. The um, average price or the median price, that's where half the sales were above and half or below, is 195000 and there were 8.6 months supply of condos. So what was going on in Montpelier? Well, we exceeded the state average. Um, the median price this year is 282000 That's up 13% from a year ago, uh, from January to, to September a year ago. Um, days on the market has been cut in half. Properties a, a year ago were taking 140 days on average to sell. We're now selling in 69 days. And our month of supply of inventory is down to 4.1 months. So it's a seller's market in Montpelier. Uh, condos, uh, similar, the median price in Montpelier is up to 193500 That's a 17% increase uh, over a year ago. The days on market has decreased somewhat, not as much, but by 25%. And the month supply of inventory of condos is even lower at 3.7 months. Uh, well, maybe you want to think about Burlington. They, they're building a lot of stuff up there. It's a, there's, they're managing a lot of uh, uh, new projects. It's much more new construction than, than we're seeing around here. Problem is, the median price up there is 308000 Question? No, I think it was interesting that uh, Harry reminded us that the idea of a condo is something that a lot of us think of in one way, but it's a broader definition. So when you talk about condo prices in Montpelier, what's the, um, are there most condos in Montpelier parts of older homes that have been I wouldn't say most. I think, you, you know, I don't know that the, what the category is actually townhouse dash condo. Oh. And I think they're referring to the typical, the, the common knowledge of what a condominium is, like Murray Hill or Independence Green, that kind of thing. Um, but at any rate, your prices did not go up as high in Burlington. They only went up 5% compared to Montpelier, but they're up higher. They're at 308,000. There's only 2.2 months supply of single family homes in Burlington. Uh, their condo price uh, this year is 236000 and uh, month supply of inventory is 1.4, so things are very tight in Burlington. There is another option, Barry. Uh, the prices there are considerably lower than the towns I've mentioned and considerably lower than the state average. Uh, the median sale price for a single-family home in Barry was down 2% this year to 152000 that's 150,000 less than Burlington, 90,000 less than Montpelier. Um, townhouse condo category, the price there was 167,000. Uh, that was actually up 13% um, from a year ago. So I just thought these statistics might give you a sense of, of where the market's at and um, you know, what, what help you in trying to figure out what, what might work for you. So, can you send those out to, to your I can do that. We can make that part of the report we'll, we'll send. Sure. What's, what's the availability in Barry? Well, let's see. The Barry uh, inventory of homes for sale, there were 84 homes for sale in September. Mm -hmm. That's down from a year ago. There were 128. Um, Montpelier, there are 26 single family homes for sale mm -hmm. compared to 26 a year ago. So it's, it's been busier in Montpelier for a while, I think. Um, we're going to move on now just to touch base on some of the projects we've talked about at prior meetings. Um, some of those are moving along. Some of them aren't. Uh, but I think uh, first I'll ask uh, briefly for Jay Ansel to tell us a little bit about one project, in particular 250 Main. He's been involved with and anything else he has to update us on. Thanks, Jay. Hi, Jay Angel, architect of Black River Design. Been uh, in town here about 38 years. I'm also going to be a downsizing. Uh, 250 Main, I think we met actually there a few number of months ago with some of you. Um, Jeff Nick owns the property. It's the old Nicky headquarters and looking at it at a sort of a cottage type of development there, potentially 21 units or so. Uh, some duplex, some single, and at the moment he's sort of doing further study as what some of the options are there, how to work with the topography and the soils. Um, 
it is sort of topographically challenged, but it's nothing that can't be addressed. Um, it's probably a lesser slope than a third of Montpelier where we built on many years ago. Uh, I, I know that's sometimes a concern, but I think if we look back at the communities that we know and love, and could they be formed under what is of a concern at this state, if they couldn't, maybe we should rethink what our standards are. So I think that could happen. I asked him what is his timing. I think he would look at probably next summer, fall uh, for construction. Your survey is wonderful. It has, answers a lot of questions that I think he had and that we had in looking at what these units might be and would try to respond to those and then have some additional meetings with you as that moves along. Um, we uh, were as a participant, the architect in the uh, net zero team bridges. We were sort of that, uh, the winning group there and we're looking at uh, additional options along that corridor, meeting with some of the stakeholders there. This would be sort of transportation-based development, which would allow some opportunities in a number of properties there, probably more multifamily. Um, you perhaps saw some of the uh, news flashes on the bud cars that are in Vermont, and um, potentially a couple of them could run Barry, Waterbury, uh, which would also provide transportation. You could downsize, perhaps need only one car or less than much of your life. Uh, could be met by walking, biking, uh, or on the cars. Uh, we were looking at sort of approaching net zero and energy improvements by a change and alteration of lifestyle, and we think in some ways a better lifestyle. Uh, certainly some issues with having those tr trains run with AOT in the state to have them operate. I think they feel that there's a fair number of improvements need to be made to the rail and the bridges, although when you look at it, year ago or so where you had the train cars running and box cars full of granite, I estimate those weigh about 500,000 pounds each. The single cars are about 100,000 pounds. So hopefully we can have some realizations that this really is not the same. They go 14 miles an hour and open up a number of possibilities there. Um, the, one of the things we talked about last time and, and uh, can be an assistance or an obstacle is zoning. Montpelier, you probably read, has been through a lot of rounds of what is happening with the zoning the master plan. They are now uh, basically are readopting a 2010 plan with a few tweaks uh, that will allow them to move forward with the zoning. And those hearings are going on now. There have been, I had asked them, for instance, about a third of the city was being rezoned as rural. And to my mind, if we're looking at more housing and trying to have it be uh, affordable instead of two acres and potentially having uh, 12 units on 24 acres allowing it to be a cottage development you're going to be on four acres which will also help reduce costs and I think they are now allowing that so and this this week there were some requests to perhaps have some of the land along Berry Street go into the rural not to the rural to the riverfront zoning which would allow some higher density there and I think there's probably going to be some response which will also facilitate some housing through that that corridor or a little higher density. Um, I th one thing that Montpelier in many cities needs is more uh, market rate affordable housing. There are some wonderful programs we're working with the French Bloc uh, that will be mostly um, low income but some affordable, uh, but looking to have more affordable market rate. Part of what is difficult relative to the costs are that you see developers that will build in Burlington and the construction costs are similar to here. It might be $200 a square foot for the house itself, yet what they can get for them is, as, as was mentioned, one and a half to two times what we get here. So that's, that's a hurdle. Um, so we are looking at doing a number of additional projects and uh, talking with stakeholders, probably be getting back with you and seeing if there are some that target some of the specific interests and then get together and look at, we can see if we can move some forward. Yep. Um, is there anything um, in the works for upper floors from the TD Bank? Yes. There is, and he'll talk about that. Oh. Right now. There are. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, Steve Rivellini hasn't made it here, has he? One of the projects we've talked about, and you're probably well aware of, is the new apartment buildings he's building down near the co-op. Uh, I think it's called Maple Way is the name of the, the road off of Berry Street. And I, I talked to Steve the other day, I guess they're coming along and he thinks some of those may be available as, as early as this winter and others maybe not till early spring, but uh, that, that has six units, six two bedroom units. And Steve Ribellini uh, is here in town. You can track him down or I can help you with that if you have 
questions about that one. Uh, you asked about the TD Bank building, and yes, Doug Nettie is uh, does have plans. This is the building at Staten, Maine, uh, and starting January 1st, he told me he's going to convert the top floor. It's a three-story building to nine modern high-end apartments. Uh, there will be two types, he said, one bedrooms, and he called them lofts, but I think they're really studios. So, uh, one bedrooms and studios up there. Uh, he said they would have high windows, air conditioning, European appliances. Uh, <laughs> small. small appliances. Uh, an elevator. They have an elevator there. You can put in new plumbing and parking for those units will be at City Center across the street, which he also owns conveniently. So. Uh, these are rentals. These will be apartments. Uh, he said he expects them to be ready to occupy in May or June, and he said he will launch a website with more information about the units around February 1st. So stay tuned if you're interested in that. Uh, but that's not the end of the projects that are happening in Montpelier. Bill? Yes? Quick question on, uh, Steve's not here. Uh, six units in that, are the top floors, is there a lift or elevator or anything? In the I believe there is an elevator, yeah, yes. Uh, and he'll have parking there on site. But uh, Diane's going to introduce our next speaker to tell us more. Great. Thank you. Um, we have Liz Genge here. Uh, Liz was kind enough to be here for our last meeting, I think. So this is her second meeting. She's Director of Property and Asset Management at Down Street. And she'll update us on a few projects that they're working on. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Thanks. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I'm Liz. and. We have at Downstreet Housing and Community Development, we used to be known as Central Vermont Community Land Trust, for those of you who might recognize that better. Um, we, have, we already have 134 apartments and, in Montpelier, and we are adding 48 new apartments. So I'm here to talk a little bit about that. It doesn't include the condominiums that we manage also on Barry Street, and I'm not gonna talk about that today. But our home ownership center and our website, downstreet.org, you can get more info on the, on the condos. <laughs> so the French block um, above Aubuchon Hardware will be 18 apartments, studios, and one bedrooms. They'll be um, able to rent, ideally, December of 2018. Uh, so that's, that's still our goal. And, and, then, uh, and then I'll talk about the one Taylor Street apartments, which will be 30 apartments. That looks more like May, June of 2019. Um, so some of the qualifications, <coughs> I'll start with qualifications and the different income things and the rents and the square footage um, and some design and then I will leave my cards for more information. Um, so the French block apartments which will be happening first, 18 are low income housing tax credit program which is what our big funding source is which means that I don't have a mortgage to pay so I'm able to keep my rents lower than the average rents. So um, four of those will be market rate apartments. One will be, uh, one will be capped where your income is not quite market but for two people the income maximum is $47,300 a year. The other three of those apartments, there is no income cap at all. So the French block apartments, um, again, studios to one bedrooms. Square footage uh, of the studios to one bedrooms is a little small, 500 to 650 square feet. Um, heat's included in all of our apartments, and the rents for the market rates will be about $800, including your heat. Um, and then let me just say one one thing, a lot of the, a lot of people who are interested in, in housing programs, they might not think that you qualify, even if you're your maximum income or what have you, because you might have some assets. Like I think a lot of folks might have like homes, correct? So that doesn't disqualify you at all. I just want to briefly explain how in housing programs we look at your income from assets. So for example, if you owned a home uh, that's potentially say it's worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars right now, and um, if you had a mortgage still owed on it, we would subtract that mortgage out of the value of your home. Let's say you didn't. So if your home is worth $250,000, we look at how much it would cost you to cash it out. So we look at a realtor fee and, and its closing cost. So the value of your home to us would be $234,000, so correct? And then of that, we would impute 
the potential income, which is given to us at 0.06%, I can hear myself, this is so crazy, but this is what it is, <laughs> and your annual income from that home is $1,408, and that's what we would count towards your income. So sometimes people fear that they, or if you have a retirement savings of $300,000 in the bank, if you're not getting any return on that, we would impute it at that 0.06%. So we would count $180 a year for your income on that $300,000. But most people are getting a bigger return. We would count the real return that you're getting. Say you're getting a 5% return on your retirement annually. That's the $15,000 that we would count. So it, it's, it varies, but that's how we look at assets and that we add that to people's income. Um, so that's the French block very quickly. Again, we're hoping December 2018. And the t one Taylor Street Apartments is very exciting. The transit center, the fr you know, wherever people are calling it. Uh, it's on one Taylor Street in town. Um, there's going to be 30 apartments, brand new building. It's going to be um, a transit center on the bottom floor. So it'll be nice high, high ceilings. Um, Green Mountain, you know, there'll be a transit center, they'll have their own space, potentially a cafe in there, there's things going on, so that'll be exciting. Um, 19 of those 30 apartments are the tax credit apartments where we look at your maximum income. So that maximum income for the tax credit apartments, both at French Block and at Taylor Street, for two bets for two people is $35,500. So there's a segment of those. And then we have 11 apartments at the new Taylor Street apartments that won't have that cap. Um, seven of them will be truly market rate units. We don't look at income. So these apartments will be ready um, about May of 2019. Again, there'll be one and two, zero stu big studios, one bedrooms and two <coughs> bedroom apartments. The one bedroom apartments here are more like seven, 720 square feet. And the two bedrooms about you know, eight to 900 square feet. So a little bit bigger than the French block. And the rents for the one bedroom apartments, the range for the rents for the one bedroom apartments will be from $700 to $900, again, including all your heat, depending on what your income might be. And the rents for the two bedroom apartments will be, uh, start at $900 and go up to $1,200, $1, maybe $1,250, including your heat. And it'll be the air source heat pumps. It'll have air conditioning. Um, you'll be able to see the state house. You won't be looking right at Capitol Plaza. I, I recently saw the plans. I'm very excited about it. And I don't want to talk too, too much, but we're not accepting applications yet for these because they're still a little far out. As you know, we haven't broken ground on, on these pr programs, so we don't want to jump the gun. Um, but if you have any questions or how to apply or questions about our other apartments, you let me know if my card's here, and again, our website. Are the market rates with no income guidelines the same apartments? Yeah. So they're, they're not upgraded or? That's right, they're all the same. same. And like, for example, we have the River Station Apartments, which is by the Hunger Mountain Co-op mm -hmm. there. We have seven market rate apartments in there, and <coughs> the others are the tax credit. So we're, they're all the same, it's just the rents that you pay are, are a bit different. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, there's no um, determination, luckily. Meaning, so what does it, mean? it means that when someone applies for, there's 30 apartments at Taylor Street, correct? And if someone applies and you're making more income than the tax credit ones, then you can get into a market rate apartment. So their rent will be higher because someone's income will be higher. Does that answer your question? What the developer wants to charge? I think the question yeah. was, I think the question was, how do you determine market rate? Right. Oh, we well, we looked at the market. Well, we had market studies done um, in 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 Montpelier, and we're looking at that. And, and also, you know, we're also a a nonprofit, and we just we want to be able to rent the apartments swiftly and keep you know affordable to people who. You know, market rate, you could be making a million dollars or you could be making 70,000 or you could be making 50. So the rents um, reflect what we need to get to make sure the buildings are operating well into the future. I just have a question about um, the 
of, what did you call it? They said Taylor Street. This is where the buses are going to come? Yes. All the buses are going to come through there, right? It'll be like the bus stop, yeah. The bus, the bus stop. But I'm wondering what you're doing about pollution from, from those buses. Because if you live up there, and the buses are down there spewing whatever they're spewing, and they're, they're idling and whatever they do, has anybody given any, any thought to that? Do you want to answer that question, Allison? Allison Friedkin is our de development of the real estate development. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, Allison Friedkin, Director of Real Estate Development at Down Street. Excellent question. So, uh, briefly, if you were to imagine this new building, it has two blocks. I like to think of it as building blocks that we all had as kids. So, you have two blocks, and then you put the long block across the two blocks. So, one of those blocks is the transit center, and one of those blocks is the lobby for the housing. And then the housing actual units are the long, so second, third, and fourth floor, okay? So this block, that's the transit center, that's what's on Taylor Street. The lobby for the housing is at the other end, so because of the parcel is a long narrow, so into. So there's two types of buses that we expect at the transit center. The big buses, the Greyhounds, the, you know, the, um, uh, the link, thank you, the link. Those will stop on Taylor Street, turn off their engines, folks will load, folks will unload, okay? They do not go under the building, they do not circulate around the building. They have to stop on Taylor Street, it's a size issue. The smaller bus, the one that takes us through Montpelier and also runs up to Waterbury, that one circulates under the building, again, because we've got the two blocks. That one circulates under, but it just drives under like a car or any other thing and it comes back around and then stops in front of the transit center, that, this block over here, turns off, and that's where it does its loading and unloading. Okay. So we're not, okay, I appreciate that answer your question, but I just want to say, so this was something that was, you know, well studied and well documented, and um, we don't feel that there'll be any adverse effect to residents, it'd be no different than you living anywhere else in the city and having the usual amount of car traffic, so. Okay, thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, any last questions? Is the percentage of apartments you offer as market value versus the some size dictated by the federal funds that are used for development? Pretty much. I mean, well, so we're able to, for example, let the Taylor Street apartments tap into, ideally, nothing is completed yet the state VHCB housing bond that will allow us to build apartments for a range of, of in, yeah, it depends on the, the funding that we're getting. Um. <coughs> I, I guess the other part of my question is if, you know, through studies or uh, however it can be made uh, obvious that there are a lot more people in the market value that's something that can be adjusted? This hat is the adjustment, I understand. We have, so we have 25, uh, at least at least 25 folks that are qualified waiting on our list for market rate at the River Station Apartments. Um, so we, we do know the, the need and, and so, you know, when we also can rent apartments that are at this lower income as well in Montpelier in the range, so. Uh, that's what we, you know, exist for. So, uh, you know, as you may have known, the one Taylor Street uh, property was going to be operated by a for-profit. And again, I think it was kind of what Phil said, it just, it didn't make enough money in our current market in Montpelier for them to, to make it work. So we, we are stepping in and we're, it's going to be fabulous and we're going to have a range that includes, again, so of all these 48 new apartments coming in, um, 10 are going to be about market rate. Let's so. get one question. I have a quick question. Yes. What's the pet policy for Down Street? Well, right now, the pet policy. So, right now, for Taylor Street and for French Block, we're thinking about upgrading or changing our policies. Right now, we don't allow pets unless you have a reasonable accommodation for an animal. Um, but that could change. All of our apartments are non smoking, it'll be non smoking campus. Um, and we're evolving again. So I'm love. Thank you for doing the survey because that will help us. And again, this is new for us also to have brand new, a lot of market rate apartments. And we're excited to to meet the needs of the community. That's what we're here for.
Thank you. Okay, so next we're going to have um, Ronnie Coleman, who's here from HomeShare, and this is she's going to talk about how it's possible for you to adapt your home to be able to accommodate perhaps another renter, so you can arm share in your your home with a renter. Um, and Ryan's been, I'm just reading from what she sent me, so I'm posing. Um, she's been crafting um, and uh, mediating home sharing agreements with Home Share now since 2011. Um, she earned her master's in, med in mediation and applied conflict studies in the Woodbury Institute and the Champlain College and in 2007. And outside of her role at Home Share now, she helps individuals and groups navigate challenging situations with her business partner at Riverstone Resolutions. You're on. <laughs> So that's me. <laughs> um, so I work for HomeShare now, um, and I think some of you know about the program. Some of you have already talked to me about it. Um, what we do is we work in Orange, Washington, and Lamoille counties, and we match people who have extra space in their homes with people who are looking for affordable housing. So we are an affordable housing organization. We're a nonprofit. Um, we're partially funded through the state and partially funded through private grants and donations. Um, and we've been in existence since 2003. Uh, we started under the Council on Aging, um, where we were matching primarily older homeowners with younger um, people that were looking for affordable housing. And there's a combination generally of exchange of a little bit of money and a little bit of services. Um, in 2010, we expanded our mission to serve all ages, all populations, <laughs> all types. Um, so we split with the Council on Aging um, since um, elderly population was no longer our focus. And now we serve people, we've had babies in our program, <laughs> um, you know, uh, families with children. Um, and I think the oldest home provider that we've had was 101. Um, so. Age is not a is not a uh, a factor necessarily. Um, so this is a little bit of a twist on sort of the idea of downsizing. Um, so I kind of see in terms of this group two sort of options for you. One is a lot of you own your homes, um, and you're maybe empty nesters. You have looked like in the statistics. Some of you have four bedrooms. Um, some of you have two or three bedrooms, and the idea would be to have somebody move in with you to fill one of those bedrooms or several of those bedrooms um, and provide you with a little bit of extra income um, and potentially provide you with some services that you may want or need. You know, maybe your kids used to uh, mow the lawn <laughs> or shovel the walk or any of those things. Um, so we have people that move into people's homes and they uh, maybe cook a few meals a week or they clean the house. Um, or they do, they bring in the wood, um, they help, the, help keep the, the fire going in the, in the winter, any number of things. Um, and some of them pay a little bit of rent. Um, we do have about 30% of our matches don't pay any rent. Um, they only do services. Um, and that could be like 10 to 12 hours a week um, of work that you could have done around your house um, and for you. Um, the, um, and then some people pay um, up to $400, $500 for a bedroom in somebody's home, and, and the flip side would be they wouldn't necessarily provide you any services. Um, so, and then it runs the, sort of runs the gamut. The flip side of that is if some of you are looking to, um, to sell your homes, to not, to not own a home and have that responsibility any, anymore, is you could move into somebody else's home and help them. Um, and provide a little bit of money, provide a little bit of services, anything in between. Um, and we do have home shares um, like that. Our average age um, of a home provider, which is what we call the people that own, own their homes, um, and are having somebody move in, the average age is 78. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, a lot of, uh, sort of a lot of older people are doing this. Um, and then the average age of people that are moving in is, is 56. So it's not necessarily people, you know, in college or in their 20s trying to figure out what to do. Um, usually people come to us in some sort of transition. Um, either they're empty nesters, um, they're going through a relationship change, they're retiring, um, they've just moved to the state sometimes and they're not quite sure where they want to be. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons. Um, and um, so that's sort of that helpful piece. 
Um, so what we do, um, as opposed to going to something like Craigslist or putting up a flyer, um, is you'd come to us um, because we do extensive background checks, criminal background checks, both state and federal. Um, and we do um, reference checks, so we check people's housing references, employment references, personal references, um, and we do extensive interviewing. Um, so for the people that own the homes, we would go out to their house and so we could see the space and meet them. Um, and we'd spend an hour and a half, two hours kind of getting to know them, asking lots of questions. The flip side is the people that are looking for housing, they come to our office and we interview them there. We ask the same questions of everybody. So we get to know people pretty well. And then we start the matching process. And that's really sort of where the magic happens, <laughs> um, is we're matching people not only on where they want to live and how much they can pay and the services they can provide, but also lifestyle. You know, if, if somebody tells us that they're up at 4, 4 a.m. every morning and, you know, making a ruckus in the kitchen and doing their thing, most likely we wouldn't match them with somebody that, you know, goes to bed at midnight and gets up at 10 a.m. So we match for lifestyle as well. Um, and people come to us with all kinds of sort of requirements, um, all kinds of sort of things that they bring. And somebody asked about pets earlier. That's a big one, <laughs> um, is people either have pets in their homes that they need help taking care of. Maybe they go away on vacation, and it's nice to have somebody around to take care of their pet right in their own house. Or we have people looking for housing that have pets and have a real hard time finding apartments that they can rent. They may have the money, um, but there's no apartments available that will take a dog or a cat or a bird or whatever it is that they happen to have. Um, so I'm just planting the seed <laughs> for some of you um, that, are, that are thinking about this. Um, the other thing that we do um, as sort of an offshoot of our program is we provide conflict resolution services to community housing organizations. So we've done a little bit of work with Down Street um, and some senior housing um, um, buildings sort of across the state. Um, but in sort of thinking about you guys and thinking about, I'm imagining some of you are thinking maybe about co-housing um, spaces, communities. Um, so what we can do is, you know, as you know, sometimes your neighbors are a little challenging. Sometimes you're the neighbor that's a little challenging. <laughs> you know, no judgment. <laughs> um, um, is um, we can come in and we can help um, um, help with some of those conflicts um, to smooth out your living situation. You know, everybody wants to live in a peaceful, calm, nice, quiet space, whether that's within your own home or within your neighborhood. You know, you sort of want to pull up into your driveway or into your parking lot and go, oh, I'm home, this is great, right? You don't want to pull into your driveway and wonder if your neighbor is, you know, peeking through their curtains, you know, spying on you. Um, so we can help with sort of some of those, um, some of those things that come up in housing. Um, and I think, I think I've said it all, but are there any questions? So uh, when, you, when you do a match, how long do matches last? That's a good question. So matches last a variety of, of lengths. Um, our average match lasts a year. Um, we have had our longest match is um, six and a half years, um, and then sh some of our shorter matches, you know, may last months. It really just depends. Um, but people don't tend to like transition too much. Um, so people that come to us, we don't do short-term housing, we don't do emergency housing. So people tend to come to us wanting to, you know, have something pretty permanent. Um, yeah. Besides the services you described, are you actually involved with the the lease documents and things like that. Oh, you are? Yes, yes. Thank you for asking that question. I totally skipped that part. <laughs> That's part of the process. Um, is once people get into a match, they meet each other and they decide that they want to move forward in their match, um, they do what we call a two-week trial. And so the person moves in to the other person's home, basically trying it on for size. Let's see if what we've talked about, what we've, you know, our, our expectations, our boundaries, all of that stuff, see if, see if it actually works once we're living under the same roof. Um, and so my job <coughs> is to come in and help people write an agreement. Um, and so it's a little bit like a lease, but it's way more personal. So how are we going to share the kitchen? Who's going to shovel the walkway when? How, you know, who's going to clean what when? What products do we use? 
Um, how are we going to talk to each other if things aren't going well? How do we approach each other? What does that look like? We talk about all of those pieces. So it's just a, it's a much more sort of personal, interpersonal kind of um, document. Are people paying you for the services? Or are they just making contributions? Or? Another good question. <laughs> we have one fee. Um, and we call it a match fee because it is assessed once you get into a match, you've been through the two-week trial, you guys both decide, everybody decides that they want to move forward, then we do have one fee. It's um, a sliding scale based on income, anywhere from $100 to $500. Um, and so um, that the, the fees that our um, participants pay us um, account for about 3% of our budget. So it's a pretty pretty nominal fee for what you're getting. Um, and we also realize that people come to us because they need affordable housing and don't necessarily have you know, $100 to hand out. Um, so we do payment plans um, for sure, and they can start into the future. Some people say, when I get my tax return, <laughs> you'll be the first person I pay. That's OK, because you know, we understand that, that people come to us because they oftentimes because they have issues with money. Um, the other piece to that is that we have had, people have gone to their church and their church has paid that fee, um, the Elks Club, um, all manner of sort of community organizations um, generally are willing to either contribute or pay the whole fee. So, yeah. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Our next speakers are going to tell us about uh, their experience uh, planning to build a new small home. Um, Larry, and, Larry and Barbara Florsch are longtime area residents. Uh, they lived in Adamant for 32 years. I think they said it was on 15 acres and up a hill three miles out of dirt road. Uh, I guess they sold their house a little over a year ago and been looking for a change. So uh, we'll welcome them up to tell us about their experience. So I thought we would divide this into to two sections. One is the uh, why and how, and then what we're doing now. So we, as Phil said, we had a place that was four bedrooms, two and a half baths, a lot of land, a beautiful, beautiful place, loved it. But looking forward, Larry's turning 70, I'm 67. Looking forward, we said, this is not really sustainable for us. I mean, how are we gonna age in place here? It, it didn't feel right. We wanted one floor. Uh, we wanted all the things that were on that list. You know, open floor <laughs> plan, two bedrooms, two baths. You know, that pretty much sets us. So we were not in a position to purchase anything new or build anything new without selling our house, so we sold it and became transient. And, um, and it's been an adventure. We've lived in four places over the last, not, not a little over a year. Uh, Bolton, Florida, we've been to Texas, we've been to South Dakota, I mean, we've been everywhere. But right now we're currently in the New York North Inn in Burlington in a condo. And we've had all of our, we, we got rid of so much stuff. I became stuff at first. And we had a basement. There was nothing, it took me a year to clean out the basement. There was nothing in there I, we needed. So we got rid of probably. Well, the mason jars. The mason yeah. jars. We got, rid of, we got rid of maybe, um, I'm saying it, it, over half of everything we own. We have tractors and gators and sofas that people are hosting. Um, and, and, and everything's been in storage and we've been traveling. And so our initial intent was to, the utopian idea was to establish a, what we call compound with my son and his family. But, but that did not work out economically and there's a lot of reasons it didn't work out. So we are going to be closer to them. But when we started looking for a house, we could not find any house that met our expectations. We couldn't even find a house we wanted that cost a lot more than we wanted to pay because they were too big or they had two floors, or they had a basement, or they weren't in the right location, or they were a small ranch <clears throat> that wasn't energy efficient They would have to be totally retrofitted and didn't have space. So we took to looking for property, finally found some Dodge Farm community in Berlin uh, mountain views and so forth, 5.7 acres, and we're closing on a construction loan Tuesday. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Probably. And the house. You can yeah. tell them about the house. <laughs> Do you have any questions about why? I just say it takes courage and conviction. And I never had any um, real reluctance to do it because I knew in the long run we would not settle for something that would not make us happy. So as long as we had that conviction, we just had to, to move forward, you know, trusting that we would get where we needed to go. So what inspired us to build the house was I was invited by our builder to see the Habitat for Humanity house that they just built in East Montpelier, which is a passive solar house. And I got thinking, well, if they can build this for Habitat for Humanity, maybe I can build one similar that I can afford. So we started from that uh, plan and moved forward. Uh, we started doing sketches on you know, napkins and all this kind of stuff about what we wanted. And uh, we involved our builder. And the biggest thing, of course, was finding the land. That took us, like it seems, forever. But between finally, finally coming up with the land and then getting a, a plan that we really liked, we've come up with a, what we think is going to be a house that will be very close to uh, net zero. It won't be totally. Uh, we're asking for things that kind of blow the, the, the whole uh, net zero thing out, like a, 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 a range hood that vents outside <laughs> or uh, a gas fireplace for ambiance. You know? So these kind of things don't, you won't qualify for the net zero label, but it'll be close. And that means it'll be relatively efficient to heat it. We're going to heat it with a heat pump and if necessary, we have the gas fireplace. 13 inch walls. Yeah, it's, it's got all the stuff that you would, you would know all this stuff, you know. Corrugated and, uh, outside. You know, our our okay. 80 or 90 <laughs> ceiling insulation, all that kind of thing. And uh, we've, we went through this whole process. And of course, with the bank, you have to get an appraisal from the bank as to what this place will be valued at when you, uh, when you finally get it built. And we had some issues there because the appraiser didn't take into account all of the high efficiency stuff. And but so we they were coming in with them. Yeah, well they were coming in with an estimate that was lower than what we wanted to borrow. So we challenged them and they finally came back with an estimate that was over what we wanted to borrow. So we were in the sweet spot. So we will close on uh, on Tuesday and Hopefully the excavator will start on Wednesday, and we hope to get it dried in by the time everything freezes up and they can work through the winter and we'll be in in early spring. So 1,350 square feet. Yep. Um, two, three bedrooms, but the middle bedroom, is, even though it has a closet, is very small. It's our office. Uh, and so one, one, everything's got the handicap accessible size doors and one of the showers is a roll in sort of shower right. all concrete floors and then the other bathroom does have a tub for the grandchildren yeah we should point out this is a slab on great house it doesn't have a cellar uh it is uh as she said roll-in shower in the master bedroom the bedrooms are small but we kind of figured the most the time you spend in the bedroom is sleeping so you don't really need to dance around so oh, one big open room <coughs> a screen porch got to have that in vermont yeah <laughs> do you have any questions where's your storage uh we're gonna have to probably build a shed or a garage but there you know there are closets so and uh, a pantry <laughs> you know that kind of thing is figured into the floor plan of the yeah. house so and a mechanical room and a laundry room so uh so yep. where did you build it? You did not use an architect? Ah, that's a good story. For Which those story? of you who are Monty Python fans, the next sketch is called the architect sketch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's all right, Jay. Jay, you don't, you don't get that. <laughs> we, we decided that perhaps we should involve an architect. Because we were scared. We've never done this. And I wanted to go to Black River because we knew Guy Teschmacher quite well. And, but... Somebody else in the household. Well, we saw this house in a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just got the one we wanted. So we, we called the architect. And, we and, and I, I, I did due diligence. I, look, I, you know, I looked at his website, and I talked to him for an hour on the phone, and he was, he was talking just like what I wanted to hear. I, I, you know. And then she insisted on talking to him. She talked to him for an hour, and we were really satisfied. So what he wanted to do was a, 
a project plan that was his first step and that would cost us fifteen hundred dollars so we paid him the money and he actually met us at the site took pictures did all kinds of stuff and three days later he gave us a, and also we had to fill out a, a questionnaire you know about what we wanted in the house and and, and to get out of the house you know and uh, so three days later he sent us his project plan along with the estimate of what it would cost us to build this 1,200 square foot house, because I think at that point we were looking at 1,200 square feet. And his estimate was $631,000. <laughs> so what Larry said I, to him I is... said, you know, when you figure in the cost of the land, I said, we're talking like three quarters of a million dollars for so a 1,200 said, square foot house. Larry said we would have to put that house, if we ever wanted to sell it, if we could even afford it, which we couldn't, put that house on a trailer and haul it to California to sell it to get the money, get the money out of it. That's ridiculous. So he said, we can work with you. I can work with you. So yes, he said, he said how much do you want to spend on this house? So we, we gave him the price point. A couple of days later, he sends me this thing and he says, there's good news and there's bad news. He said, the good news is that I got it down to your price point. The bad news is that the house is only 700 square feet. <laughs> so what we did... So we sort of said thanks. thanks. But we went to our builder, and our builder uh, is... We're, we're working with Montpelier Construction, Malcolm Gray, and Malcolm's real uh, together with energy efficiency and green building, and he, he's just worked with us hand in glove. And I'm, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be better if we had architectural services, but we, you know, we're on a tight budget. And uh, we, we're satisfied, I, I think, with what we're getting. We're going to be real hands-on, you know, in yeah. front and, and there a lot saying that, not that sort of thing. So we're hopeful that it'll work out. Kim? What do you think it's going to cost? Oh, we know it's going to cost us a little over $300,000 Just a little over to build the house. That's the estimate. But that includes the land. Oh, yeah. Includes yeah. the land. Mm -hmm. And so we... That, that's to us was really e economical. The land is, as I said, 5.7 acres, and it is right at sort of the end, of, it's on Dodge Farm Community, it's right at sort of out by the airport at the end of that runway, but it's got really nice mountain views, and it's nice open rolling land, and um, so we think, you know, the house itself is not 300, it's just the, the land coming in with it. And that was one of our, our requirements, is we had lived in the woods in Adamant for 32 years, and we didn't have any views. We just had a, a clearing in the forest, and so we wanted to have something a little bit more openness to it. So this property is open, and we can see the mountains of Plainfield, and off to the other side, you can see the Worcester Range. It's going to be ultra I want the synergy of someone buying two acres next to you of some of your land. Pardon? <laughs> What's that? Now you want the synergy of someone buying two acres uh, in your land. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, actually, I was going to say I don't know. There is a large. There is one. It's very pretty land out there, and it, it's uh, four minutes from the grocery store, four minutes from the hospital, five minutes from the interstate. And about ten to downtown Montpelier. Montpelier. So. Instead of having uh, three miles of dirt and a steep driveway, we have like two hundred and fifty feet, feet of gravel, gravel and, and then it's hard top. Yeah. So Scott for us Hillary. aging in place, we think yeah. that's good. It's probably the best we're going to do. And But there is more land out there, and one piece is large and able to be subdivided. And I know at one point the sellers had tried to get it zoned where they could do the community thing. And I think eventually they did, but they said by the time it was, it was that ship had sailed or something. I don't know. <laughs> what, what compromises do you have to make the price that you most regret? Huh. I like the it to be maybe slightly smaller, but I don't really. Maybe I wish we could go ahead and afford the garage immediately. Right. Yeah. You I know think, that. Uh, I think we had to lop off the garage, you know, in the initial building. So. And we still hope to soon, but it would be nice if we knew it could all be. But you know, the thing is about storage. We are looking at that, but I don't want too much storage. Because we're all inclined to fill it up. And when I looked at what we got rid of, we don't need to fill it up. Yeah, I don't know so. if you read the article in the Bridge last <laughs> issue about storage. storage. <laughs> <laughs> I was involved in that. <laughs> you had a and question? George Carlin was right. <laughs> I missed the article. Uh. Um, I had a couple of experiences of downsizing and travel for almost five years, and mostly just a backpack. But now I have, you know, my home is, home is full again. 
I was recently in New York City in an elder's um, apartment where I stayed small, you know, the one bedroom mm -hmm. tiny, and I thought to myself, where's the fat person's life's relics? Mm -hmm. So that's what I find myself wondering about that attachment, right? Mm -hmm. What I yep. call like relics. Your place is probably big enough to accommodate. Some, relics. some. We don't have a lot of relics. But we got rid of a lot, of, got relics. Got a lot of relics. Yeah. 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 So I survived. <laughs> 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 but that's right. Any, any mindset? Any mindset tips about that? Um, you know, I think that I've never been a collector. And I think that, it, that there are just different personalities for whom it's, it's easier or harder. For me, my intent right now would be that every single thing in my house be beautiful as much as possible, handmade, and, and really please me. And um, I kept silver from the family, you know, silver eating <coughs> cutlery. Um, I, I sold the wedding china. We used it hardly ever there right. now what we're going to have to do is digitize you know cards and pictures and we're going to have to spend some time doing that but it needed to be done anyway so we have a lot of art i think that one of the things is going to be making sure we have room for our art but but i think we will but you know what's the rule of thumb if you if you don't use it within six months get rid of it because you, you don't need it right yeah. so yeah. 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 Yeah, but it's so I just think different personalities will have a different hard time with this. Yeah, there are a lot of resources out there for this whole process of both downsizing, decluttering, and dealing with the issue of what what do you need and what do you not need. And I've been doing it myself over several years now, um, and have gotten down to a, about a 400 square foot studio apartment. I have a storage closet mm -hmm. upstairs, and I have another storage unit which is partly for work stuff. But I, what I've found is that you go through a conversation, essentially, yes. with these objects. <laughs> and you try to determine what is it about the object that's important that it exists, that it be there in your life. And I found that a lot of things were mnemonic devices for me. They were links to memories. Yeah. And so the conversation I've been having is, if I don't have the object anymore, do I lose the memory? Does the memory go away? Does the experience go away? And that's an interesting one uh, to, to, cut, to contemplate. Um, and it's a very interesting process to go through. But anything you have around, ask yourself, why is it here? It, it, it's really a recreation of your life, though. As we move into that house, it's a very much a recreation. Some of the things that people are hosting, like sofas, we're just not going to get back. We don't think we want them anymore. So it's going to be interesting to see how life recreates itself in this smaller space and to hold ourselves to the discipline of only what we need. Mm -hmm. My tractor, on the other hand, I want. <laughs> <laughs> and, and whether I can pry it loose from the guy who's hosting it. There's a really interesting book, I'm actually reading it now, called um, AARP Publishes It on Downsizing. I yes. think you can probably find it through the site, and it has some really interesting insights on that. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly, because we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, about a concept that I've been focusing on for a while, and that is on a, my friend Sherry over here mentioned it to me, it was called an intentional neighborhood. So it is a grouping of single level, or taking a lot of the survey into consideration, um, <clears throat> homes that could be duplexes, that could be single family, they don't have to be, all be the same, but in an area. And I have been researching a lot, met with a lot of builders, have met with a lot of, you know, we've met with realtors, met with um, landowners, and looked at what's possible. And I found a, a couple of really good possibilities. I can't very little say anything at the moment, but um, what I'd like to find is a group of four to six people who would have a similar interest in helping move this forward so that we have kind of a, an advisory group of potential buyers of these things, of these homes, single family homes that would be either in Montpelier or in immediately surrounding Montpelier 
um, that would have all of those amenities. But what it would have that I find <coughs> critical is a mini community center so that you can reduce the size of the home you'd need so that you would have exercise space, you would have you know a couple of guest rooms, you would have workshop space, you would have a community kitchen, that kind of thing, and it draws people together. Um, independent living is going a little too far, you know, for me. It's kind of an average age of around 83 in the local independent living places. Um, that's another step, <clears throat> but between the ages of retirement, whether it's 55, 62, 60, whatever, and 83, there's a lot of years in there where you want to be with friends, you got time, you want to socialize, you want to have a community. So that is kind of what I'm working on. And if, like I say, if there's anybody who is interested in, um, you know, kind of getting involved and meeting with a builder or a landowner or really moving this forward, um, could you come up afterwards and, and uh, we, we can exchange information and uh, we can kind of go from there. So anybody have questions? <clears throat> Are you talking about new construction? New, yes, new construction, um, level slab on grade. Um, I mean, I've seen this place out in Grand Isle. Well, Grand Isle's flat, so that makes it a lot easier. But there were um, nine buildings of 18 duplexes, each one about 1,500 square feet, um, on slab, radiant floor heat, <clears throat> um, two bedrooms plus a den. Um, Nicely done. They were looking out onto a field, but you could see each other. It was a stone's throw, so it wasn't right next door to you, but it was there, and it was really nicely done. Um, so that kind of inspired the uh, possibilities, and they were retailing for around two eighty nine, two ninety nine. So you know, it, it's it's affordable, especially if you have a larger home and you want to sell it, and you know, be able to have some of the assets. Um, so anybody. The idea of a single floor has, been, has come up several times. I just want to suggest a single floor isn't necessarily necessary or even desirable. That stairway means exercise. Mm -hmm. And unless you already have a problem that keeps you from using a set of stairs, that exercise is there whether you feel like going down for a walk or not. I mean, that's true, it's, um, but it's so just based upon the survey results that people yeah, seem to want single yeah. level, but single level living. So you could have a second floor that was a studio or a guest room or something, but that adds square footage that you're not gonna have as a livable square footage that you would use, and then that doesn't become quite so downsized. So that's all. Yes? Early on, there was a conversation about, or it was mentioned that the Redstone building. Right. Um, was there available and that there was land around it? Um, we've talked to, we've had conversations with the state and the city and they're just not ready to move on anything at the moment. I mean, there, it's gonna be years before it happens from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, <clears throat> so th this meeting has provided a, a nice uh, range from renting to buying, mm -hmm. different sizes, different incomes. But I think there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned and that is one of the important things about the rezoning that's going on. And that is rezoning so that there can be infill building within Montpelier, within walking distance of downtown. Not only infill new construction, but infill dividing some of the well, large Well, define houses. infill. Look, define, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. Infill means that, well, it, it can mean one of two things. It can either mean uh, a double lot, that can be subdivided within the and town. You can, you're where you, under the current zoning, you can't build right. because of density requirements. Under the new zoning, you'd be able to build. The second thing is it means being able to subdivide a large Victorian into two two apartments, um, or even three. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, this is an option that, when you look at how many people own homes, mm -hmm. they're owning homes in Montpelier, they may find that they actually have a home that they can continue to live in and prep and not share it, but actually subdivide it and create a company. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's entirely I, possible. I hear some people who may be talking about Well, we probably just haven't run into those people who are doing it. That's all. <laughs> we into one. We okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got to go. We'll, we'll have time at the end for some more questions, but uh, thank you, Carrie. Okay. Uh, we'll get back to you. Um, 
Yes, the actually I think Kim can correct me, but I think the new zoning will allow any house in Montpelier to be turned into a duplex by right. So Not that, any house. No, that's yeah. Okay, a number of houses, more houses say, than under current zoning. So, okay. any, any. so <laughs> most houses, according to some of our counselors. So um, just briefly, we're going to touch on the subject of co-housing. Uh, John Ryan is here, who knows a lot about co-housing, and he is also going to uh, talk about something else. This will be very brief, and then I'll tell you about a couple of co-housing projects that are happening now. Um, where's John? Here. There he is. Okay. Just a couple minutes. Great. I will try to be brief, and uh, it wasn't my intention actually to talk about co-housing, though I had taken three groups larger than this through the process of creating co-housing communities um, uh, in Massachusetts over a period of time. And I am interested, I believe it is a viable concept um, for folks who are older in which, and one in which it's possible to do it in combination with an, a multi-generational group of people. Um, but while I was inspired, totally inspired by the, the nitty gritty of thinking about the housing, you know, the housing itself, the, you know, the size of it, what floor things are on and the like. Um, it, it also occurs to me that in my life I have often seen that we often jump to solutions more quick before we think clearly about what is it we're trying to solve. And so, um, you know, one of the things that has inspired me as I reach what I just learned from the survey to be a new form of life, I am called semi-retired now. Um, I didn't have that before. Was what really brings, you know, purpose, what brings meaning to the next 30 years of my life? If I'm going to hope to live for 30 years, why? Is it just to get up in the morning or are there other things that I want to do? Um, and, and there are certainly other things that I want to do and I think we all do. And what, what we're trying to talk about here is really coming to terms with the, the first step of the courage that, um, that, that this book really inspired in me. And I hope all of you have read this. It's really a marvelous book. It's called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. Um, and he really talks about the courage um, of the people who inspired him in thinking about the end of, of their lives um, in having the courage to see the truth of their own experience. And the truth is we're all mortal and we're all getting older and we're all gonna ultimately need more care. And we're all gonna need to have other ways of expressing our purpose in this world um, as we lose some of our physical and even mental capacities over time. And I'm really excited about embracing that in a positive way. And I'm interested, as I said, I have done, I've had the good fortune in my life to spend my life helping others do things they've never done before in a variety of ways. And, um, and I would really like to, uh, to, to offer that here in this place that I have lived for the last seven years. Um, and, and so the way that, I'm, that I've thought to do this, and I'm doing it with a friend of mine and colleague, a woman named Polly Nickel, who many of you may know who lives here in Montpelier, um, and who ran housing programs for VHCB for 30 years of her life. And so, you know, where, where we want to offer is the opportunity to step back a little bit from the, where is this place going to be, what's it going to look like, to what is it that aging successfully is about. And I have a belief that this group of people and any, any, any part of this group of people has in them the wisdom and the capacity to think through the questions of how we do this successfully. And from that may emerge a way to, to do that where we live, how we live in the physical realm, but really that's just a small portion of what we're really talking about here. Um, so I wanna just, if I may, pass out these little information uh, sheets to say what we're thinking of. They're, they are really just salons that we're talking about doing. There's no cost associated with them. Um, and if it's something that you think you could commit the time to, to doing and participating in, what I will do along with Polly is sort of facilitate the questions that we might at, be asking ourselves on a bigger frame of, you know, what is it going to be like as we age? What do we want it to be like? What, is the, what are the financial issues? What are the community issues? How are we going to avoid as time goes on with what I call the, two, the, the twin evils of isolation or institutionalization? And how do we control as as Atul Gawande really inspired me with is how do we control the narrative of our lives? 
you know, and whether you're doing it in the way that you've done, which is really inspiring in its own way, or looking at it in, in ways that might have more collaboration, I'd really be interested in seeing what emerged from a group of people talking about that. So while I'm, I don't know, you don't really have I've been left time enough on the agenda, perhaps on a future agenda, I can talk about what I believe are many of the um, misconceptions, but also the true conceptions of what it's like, like living in a co-housing community, um, uh, having done so for 19 years, and as I said, having um, helped three of them that are still actively involved in Western Massachusetts. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll stay here for a little bit afterwards if folks might have questions about that specifically. But I know you're sort of at the sure. end of your conversation. Yeah. Thanks, um, Rick. There's a, I'm going to pass around a sign up. If anybody says they'd actually be interested in this, I'll leave at the back table. <laughs> a sign up um, of folks who might want to participate in one of these uh, series of salons. So thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, John. Okay. If I have a few more. Here. There are actually, we maybe talked about co-housing a little. I know Gail was involved in a group talking about it perhaps at one time. Uh, and and uh, there are some, there's a great article in Seven Days about one that was built in downtown Bristol, oh, Vermont. Yes. As much as the downtown as they have. There are Bill, three. Yes. I apologize. To yeah. On Monday here, in the downstairs of the East Montpelier room, I'm going to talk at greater length about the, these salons. So if anybody is interested or know anybody who might be interested, at least Monday at 6.30, um, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about it more length. We'll be happy to talk about co-housing with anybody if they want to okay. show. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to mention these. I heard about three co-housing developments right around Montpelier. I'm just going to mention them briefly. This is our final item. Uh, there is one that uh, somebody, in, people may know Sandy Witzhum in town, uh, is an architect. She owns uh, quite a bit of land in Berlin, which she is selling, and envisions uh, possibly being a co-housing arrangement between three and ten families with a big chunk of the land remaining undeveloped and in current use, which is a, a, a land uh, program that really reduces your property taxes. So there'd be a shared road and so forth. She brought some handouts. She couldn't make it today, but I've left some handouts on the table back here if you want to hear about that one. In Moortown, there is a co-housing group that uh, is formed. They've got, they want to have seven families. They're on a farm. Uh, I'll just read briefly what it says. Uh, they call themselves Living Tree Alliance. It was started with a dream shared of creating an echo village where residents live sustainably together, grow organic food, and share in the celebration of the rhythms of Jewish life and teachings. So I've got a couple of brochures for them, and you can find them online to Living Tree Alliance um, if you're interested in that one. And then I just heard about one in Callis. I think they've just closed on land. There's envisioned six families there. I think they've had five already committed to the plan, and uh, they're looking for one more. Uh, but they told me they're looking for a multi-generational uh, situation. They, so they're looking for a young family uh, to fill up the, the sixth spot. If any of you consider yourself young, see me after the, <laughs> after the, after the meeting. Um, but really, that's about it. Any, any uh, final questions or comments? And we, There's one thing I, meant, I, um, I told the person I would ask, I would mention. There's a company in Vermont called Wheelpad. Um, they do standing room where there's a bedroom and a bathroom that has on wheels and you would just drag it up to the house um, and then you could attach to it. It was designed for um, a veteran that was handicapped so that is wheelchair friendly and accessible and it has, um, you know, um, what do you call the Ramps. Yes. Yes. You get down the, the, the boardwalk up. Ramp. 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 Um, and so that was something that is on wheel pad dot org or dot com, so I, I would mention that. Okay, and, and for anything here, if you have more questions or want more information about that organization or anything, anything else we've talked about today, our email address is montpelierdownsizinggroup at gmail.com. Uh, so any final questions, comments? One here? Um, yeah, um, I'm really interested in a double unit modular housing that's built by Vermont, 
And if you look at their website or their Facebook page, it looks like it's all about a low income and replacing um, mobile homes with one of their homes. But they also sell the individuals. And I, I went through the demo model a year ago, and I really love the feel of it. I love the light. I have to have light, 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 light in these long winters. And also, it's just totally energy efficient. And like I said, they have the one that looks like a mobile home, but they also have a double unit, which is um, off-center. So it's not that boxy. But anyway, I the issue for me is finding land. But if anybody want, is looked into it or is interested, I'd, be, I'd love to talk with you afterwards. And what's the name of the company is Vermont, B E R M O D, and um, Vermont. Vermont. Okay. Good. Well, I want to uh, uh, thank all our speakers today and thank you for coming out. Um, keep thinking about it.